Hello, Earth. So today we are very excited to bring to you Year Only Mock 2024 Advanced Level Physics. I'm going to be your physics tutor, Ivy Astro Allen. Let's dive right in. So the very first question says, um, a step-down transformer with a turn ratio of 5 is to 4 and an efficiency of 88% is used to run a motor. If the mains AC is 5.0 amperes, the current run by the motor will be. Okay, so of course we just need to write the efficiency equation for a transformer and that's the equation, efficiency equation. That's our output of our input times 100%. It's basically true for every other machine. So you have the efficiency to be well power output is actually current in the secondary circuit multiplied by voltage in the secondary circuit divided by the first current that's now power input right which is now uh, current in the primary multiplied by voltage in the primary. But a couple of things we can do with this and uh, the first there is actually that we can realize that Vs to Vp is always equals to ns to np all right so the ratio of the voltage in the secondary to the voltage in the primary circuit is always equal to the voltage the ratio of the number of turns in the secondary to the number of turns in the primary so we can substitute that back into the equation and then we actually have in place of the s to vp we basically have ns to np and then s there will be actually four is to five that's ns to np because the step down transform of the number of turns the secondary core less than the number of turns in the primary core okay so that the voltage is step down to step down so you have now is which you're making the subject and it's basically 5.5 amperes and our answer there is d so the next question says intensity defined as power per unit area which of the following is the base unit of intensity what well, is very easy right so if intensity is actually power per unit area and then it's clear that power is kilogram meter square per second cubed divided by area which is meter squared and you have the unit of intensity to be kilogram per second cube easy peasy lemon squeezy and so our answer there is actually b so we go ahead and So question three says an arrow is shot straight up in the air at an initial speed of 15 meters per second after how much time is the arrow moving downward at a speed of eight meters per second okay so right here you just really have to solve in two ways so the first way is just use equations of motion and then use the vector approach so initial velocity is shot upwards final velocity the pathway is traveling downwards you guys the velocity will change direction so final you see negative because now you're coming downwards of course g there is negative because again you're going against gravity all right so you're decelerating so that g is negative so we plug in the value in initial velocity is 15 the final velocity is negative 8 because you're moving downwards so and make time the subject you actually have 2.35 seconds now the method 2 would require you to just calculate the time to which maximum height and time to which maximum height is just v minus u by g plus the time to take from that maximum height back to when the particle because at maximum height the particle has zero velocity it comes to momentary rest right and it has to start falling back downwards to where the velocity is eight meters per second so if you put that in so our final velocity there is zero at maximum height u is 15 so the one is negative 15 there and then g is negative 9.8 because it is rotating upwards and then plus of course our final velocity is zero or eight this time minus initial velocity which is zero because you are from maximum height all the way to eight so initial velocity is zero then divided by 9.8 because again you are accelerating from maximum height all the way downwards you're accelerating so to add those two you actually have that and your answer is exactly 2.35 telling you that both ways work just fine In figure one, a bullet is fired from the top of a tower at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal. If the bullet takes 12 seconds to land on the ground at M, which is 720 meters from the bottom of the tower at the projection speed U of the projectile is. Okay, this one is very easy, right? So you just, you basically just X equals U T equals theta. Uh, that's the horizontal displacement of the projectile, right? So you just make U the subject. And then, of course, you substitute x is 720, t is 12, and then cos theta cos 60 is 0.5. So you punch that in, and u is 120 meters per second. 
and our answer there is just B. Which of the following phenomena provides evidence that light has a wave nature? Anyways, I'm just going to quickly talk about this. Um, now, you realize that if you look at the EM spectrum, this electromagnetic spectrum right here, uh, the particles, the waves or the radiations that are with shortest, with the shortest possible wavelengths, look at gamma here, you have X rays. These are, partic these are waves that behave more like particles, okay? You have the shortest possible wavelength. That means that hey, you are very easy to penetrate up obstacles. That's why you can use X rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet to knock out electrons from photosensitive metallic surfaces. Basically, photoelectric effect, right? Because these these tiny particles, which are called photons, can transfer their energy to the electrons in the photosensitive metallic surface, knocking out the electrons from, of course, the positive attractions of the positive nuclei of the atoms, right? So you basically realize that this photoelectric effect demonstrates the particle nature of waves, okay? So what, or of matter, so what really demonstrates the wave nature? The wave nature is demonstrated by diffraction because all waves can undergo reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference, okay? So yeah, so uh, B is the answer here. All waves can undergo diffraction. A lamp is placed 0.5 meters from a converging lens. That's the object. So that's the object distance, 0.5 meters. The power of the lens is 5.0 decibels. What is the distance from the lens to the focused image? Okay, so they are just asking for image distance to the converging lens. So you realize that, of course, the equation is positive there. 1 over f equals 1 over u plus 1 over v. So, of course, 1 over f, the, the reciprocal or reciprocal length of the lens gives you the power of the lens. So if, if we put in that expression, we're looking for V, so I can just make one of our V the subject by carrying one of our V the other way. And then we simplify, you get V as that, and so you substitute the values of U and P, you realize that our U there is just the image distance, or the object distance, which is 0 0.5, and then uh, 5 there is the power of the lens, and then uh, of course 0 0.5 is the object distance, and then minus 1, and then you actually get 0 0.33 meters, which is the image distance. So our answer there is C. If plane polarized light is sent through two polarizers, the first at 45 degrees to the original plane of polarization, the second at 90 degrees to the original plane of polarization, what fraction of the original polarized intensity passes through the last polarizer? Okay, I just have to say that there's a problem with the question, but I'm just going to talk about the problem later. So you have I n plus one equals I n cos square theta. This is Malus's law, okay? So it basically tells you what proportion of intensity of light comes through after it's polarized? Okay, so um, so I n is the original intensity before you went before like the light went to the polarizer, and then I n plus one is like the intensity you get after the light goes through the polarizer. Okay, so the theta here is like the angle the light makes or the plane of the, the direction of travel of the wave makes with the plane of polarization. All right. So in the first case, it's just 45 degrees. So you put in there, cos 45 is 1 over root 2. You square that, you have half. So our I1 is I0 over 2. I0 is the initial intensity of the waves, right? So if you have to now go through the second polaroid, or, right? So you realize that, of course, um, we're going to get the second intensity outcome, which is now I2. So our I2 is actually going to be I1 cos squared D second angle now and now i just have to make sure that this is where the problem is if this angle is 90 degrees from the original plane of polarization then you realize that the intensity of the light that will come from is zero because you put cos 90 here what's cos 90 is zero so it means that the resulting intensity will be zero so this 90 degrees is actually 90 degrees to the plane of polarization of the first polaroid is that clear such that you now have 90 minus 45 so now make the angle that the direction of travel of the wave makes with the plane of polarization of the second polaroid. Now, if you put in that value, you actually get this, all right? So you actually have I2 to be I0 over 4, which tells you that, it, of course, it decreases by a quarter for the original intensity, and our answer there is just B. All right, so we have a diffraction gradient 
with 600 lines per millimeter and is illuminated normally by a monochromatic light of wavelength 600 nanometers. The number of fringes seen excluding the central fringe is okay. So we can do our maths here. Of course, I've already displayed the answer as D. Well, you can go ahead and try solving the problem. Make sure that you have D, otherwise you will check out why it's actually D from my solving. So the normal general refraction gradient equation is of course D is theta cosec lambda, right? So you realize that of course our M there, which is the order, number of, number of possible orders you can get from a diffraction gradient experiment, um, is D is theta over lambda, right? So the D there is a reciprocal of the diffraction gradient specification. A, there is a diffraction gradient specification like what, what number of lines exist per millimeter or per meter, right? So per millimeter you have 600 lines, and then of course 600 lines per millimeter means that you have 6.0 times 10 to the power 5 per meter, lines per meter, okay? So if you wish to that, you get D. So this is our D, and then now you realize that of course the maximum possible order would be D over lambda because sine theta would just be 1, the maximum possible order, right? So, um, you realize that our M there would be, of course, you reciprocate these two, or you ratio these two things, you actually have M to be 2.78. But then you have to realize that M belongs to the set of natural numbers, and then you're getting the greatest possible, the greatest integer value for M, right? So it's 2.78, what's the greatest integer value of that? It's just, even if it's 2.99999, the greatest possible integer value of that is two. All right, you never run up because again, if you run up, there will not be any value of theta for which that experiment is true. Okay, sine theta will not exist, and that makes the whole diffraction gradient experiment messed up. So, um, yeah, so you have put two orders from this particular experiment, but let me just explain what that means. Now, look at this is an interference experiment, a diffraction gradient experiment. So, right here, you have the central bright fringe, which is like the zeroed order, and then you have the first order bright image. And then now it's it's actually in both ways. So you, down here you actually have M12 and then you have M2. So this is also M2 here. So this is one fringe. This is two fringe here. This is three fringe. This is four. This is five. Because well, I've just explained that if you have the central bright fringe and then this is the first order, this is the second order, right? So that two fringes to the upwards to the central bright fringe. There will also be two fringes because those will correspond to um, order one and order two too, right? Because order one and order two, they, are, they align on both sides. But if you are ignoring the central bright fringe, then you realize that you just have the fringes that correspond to order one and order two on both sides, which gives you four fringes, right? That's why D is the answer. Okay. So we have equation nine. So a pipe closed at one end and containing air is made to oscillate such that its third of atom is 2,800 hertz. Which of the following is its fundamental frequency? All right, this is very easy. Um, how do I get fundamental frequency? Well, for a pipe that is closed at one end, the general formula is just the, harmon the particular harmonic frequency Fn is 2n minus one multiplied by the fundamental frequency. That's the equation for a pipe closed at one end. I actually derived this on the weekend in our revision class at the at Boya and Limbe. So if you're around Boya and Limbe and you're going in for the advanced level or ordinary level, you can join us in our revision program. Boya is in Veracity University and in Limbe you have we have it at National Comprehensive. So our F4 there is basically 7F1. So you realize that our F1 there will simply be F4 over 7. Now F4 is the fourth harmonic frequency, which corresponds to the third over tone frequency. Because here the question there it says the third of a tone frequency. So you just really have to take note that the third of a tone frequency corresponds to the fourth harmonic frequency. The fifth of a tone frequency corresponds to the sixth harmonic frequency. Okay. So uh, the first of a tone frequency corresponds to the second harmonic frequency. Just be clear with that. So if we, of course, put in the data, our F1 will simply be F4, which is 2800 hertz divided by 7, which gives us uh, what 400 hertz. So our answer is B there. Right? So, yeah. God, why is it so slow? Okay, so we have in an experiment to determine the heat capacity of a metal. Heat was supplied at a steady rate of 1,000 joule per second. 
Figure 2 shows the variation of temperature with time. If the mass of the metal is 7.5 kilograms, then the value for the specific heat capacity of the metal would be. Okay, so the first thing is you have to realize the equation that is required here. So it's actually Q equals MC theta theta. If we ratio time on both sides, because you realize that you have the time rate at which heat is applied. So you have, of course, justify both sides by T. You have Q over T equals MC theta theta on T. Now, this is our temperature versus time graph. So delta theta on C simply gives us the gradient of this graph, okay? So you realize that, of course, if you make C the subject, you just have 1,000 joules per second because it's the rate at which this heat is applied. And then you divide by M, M is 7.5, and then our delta theta on C is just the slope. So you look at the slope here, just come here. You realize that you have five here corresponding to these two. So changing one over changing X, will be, this will be five over two, which gives you 2.5. So you Plug in that, that gives you 53.3 joule per kilogram per curving, and our answer is B. All right, guys, I think that uh, we've had fun. This is the end of the lesson today. So this is episode one. We'll go over to episode two. Please let me know if you liked it. Uh, comment in the comment section. Please like the video, subscribe, and share to your friends. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello guys. So it's a massive honor to have watched all the way to the end. Please leave comments down in the comment section below. If you watch all the way to this point, and comment, like, subscribe, and share to friends. It's it's an honor to help us uh, and to make sure that physics is demystified and the light of science is shared in the hearts of young learners across Cameroon and across Africa and across the globe. Thank you so much for your time. Let's go.